We've had about 16,000, 17,000 uh, migrants cross uh, the channel, haven't we? Over 100,000, by the way, was the milestone that was passed since, I think, 2018. Of course, you've seen the, so the sad loss of life at the weekend. Uh, Peter, there was a leaked memo um, about the potential placement of these people, which referenced uh, time spans as long as five years in some cases, which gives uh, the impression that this is not going away anytime soon. The government clearly don't think it is. So have we just got to get used to this? Well, it would be wise for them to plan, wouldn't it? Because they have so far failed so completely to get any sort of grip on it. The real problem is that the channel used to be partly a physical and partly a psychological barrier. People didn't think you could cross it. And then they discovered that they could. And it turned out to be extraordinarily easy, provided the weather was, was good. And so th there is now this enormous difficulty. My, my view on this has been for a long time, if you want to stop it. And it's not by any means the only migration problem this country has. Legal migration into this country is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, and on a scale which I think is... is 606,000 net migration. Being, ...is not being carefully thought about by those who, who have to provide uh, the resources and the places to live and the, uh, and everything, the schools and the hospitals for the vastly increased population we're rapidly getting. But leave that aside for a moment. The only real solution to the problem, as indeed it, it would be to the, to the similar problem of crossing the Mediterranean, is to stop people from getting into the boats in the first place. And for this, we have to rely on France. And I think we have not tried sufficiently or negotiated hard enough with the French about the, 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 the job which they have to do, in my view, of preventing these people from getting into the boats in the first place. No one can stop it entirely. But the one actual force which can seriously restrain it is the French state. And if we can get the French state on our side, and, and it would be very, very costly to do so, and I don't doubt that, then we can make an impact on it. But otherwise, I don't think it's going to change. No, I, I definitely don't think it's going to change, and my viewers certainly would agree with that. Um, but Alex, you know, even at the weekend, you saw the very sad, um, you know, situation where people were in the channel drowning, yeah. <clears throat> very close actually to the French uh, shore. But yet, even despite that, those people were then brought uh, over into Dover. So it seems that the will uh, of the French is lacking, to put it mildly. Yeah, there are two points that I've seen disputed in the most recent incidents. The first is how close they were to the French shore, but I've never seen any suggestion they were close to the UK. They were clearly much closer to France than they were um, to here. And the second is whether the broader French policy is effectively to escort boats once they're in the water to the UK rather than seeking to turn them back. Um, supposedly the French have this policy that once the boat's underway it would, off, it would be too much of a danger to try and turn the boat around and therefore uh, the safest thing to do is effectively act as a, a ferrying service or at least a chaperoning service to, um, to these shores. And there's disputes about both of those things. But what has basically convinced me about this point that, that Peter has made, that the biggest onus is, is on the French and what they do, is the arguments to be made by Tim um, Lawton, MP, because he's made the point this week in, um, in the debates about this, that when the French police seek to stop those coming to the United Kingdom unlawfully, they only act in the time between getting on a boat and that boat setting off. Yeah. And, if, and if they stop them, they just release them back into, well, so release back into the wild. They just let them back to, to, to roam in the bushes and the dunes until they can try again. Now, someone found in this country, without a lawful reason or right to be here, will, in some way or other, and we can debate how sympathetically and how they get treated and where they get, where they stay and so forth. But someone in that situation in the United Kingdom is dealt with in one way or another by the authorities. The French system is effectively catch and release. The French system is, unless um, they are actually in the water, at which point you're going to bring them back to, uh, to and they're about to set out into the water but they haven't actually gone past your knees, then you can stop their boat and, and bring them back. But then they let them go. Mm. So the responsibility is almost entirely on the French because we would not do that at all I in, don't in this think, country. I we think, need to deal with them. I think you're being overly fair to our own authorities. It seems to me that when a lot of people, when they arrive here, they, they, they may encounter the authorities, but they, they're pretty much left to their own devices in many cases. And all the figures that we have for people coming ashore are those who have actually encountered the authorities. At we don't our, know. At least our policy is to try. It seems that the official French policy is once uh, apprehended to simply release again. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not praising the, the behaviour of, of, the, of the 
forces and law of either nation in this particularly, but I don't think that we have much, uh, we have much on the French in this, uh, myself. The, the, once people have arrived in this, in this country, they tend to stay. Let me ask you very quickly, the ECHR, this, we go around in this circle all the time, whenever there's an issue, whenever there's a big crossing there, this, this concept of leaving the ECHR always comes up. Would you support that or not? I don't think it would make any difference. Uh, I think that the, the, the problem is that if the, particularly the EU countries, which includes, of course, France, uh, would take the view that if we, if we pulled out of the ECHR, they would then pull out of other quite important trading and other agreements with us. They would punish us very, very heavily economically for doing so. It wouldn't be a cost-free event, and I think that's why government's afraid of doing it. And it, it whenever, you, you know when the Tories are in real trouble, they start talking about getting out of the ECHR. But I don't think they mean it would be. It's all very well saying, well, the Canadians don't have an ECHR. They, they do have their own homegrown Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has many bad effects on Canada. Uh, but the fact is, we have got the ECHR. Uh, we have not merely signed it, but we've enshrined it under the Blair government in our own law. And we're stuck with it. And I, people don't realize just how little freedom of action modern governments have in such, in such matters and how much we can be punished uh, for, for breaking away from this. So I doubt very much, A, whether anything will happen, or B, if it did, that it would work. The problem that we have to face uh, is, as I say, we have, to, we have to control our own immigration by deciding that that's what we want to do with all the political consequences with matters that we're sovereign over and over the crossing of the channel by migrants we have to get the French and I say it will cost a great deal and it will need a great deal of very tough diplomacy we have to get the French to stop them leaving where shores you, of France in the first place. Where are you on that ECHR thing? The notion that somebody can cross many safe nations in order to cherry pick where they wish to apply for asylum or refugee status is currently true under international law and in my view it makes an absolute mockery of international law and currently interpretation, current interpretations of human rights. I'd leave the ECHR. But what about the unintended consequences that other people might highlight? So you're hearing there about potential uh, tamperings with trade relations and all the rest of it. What about that? The other countries are entitled to seek to respond as they wish. They can have tantrums if they wish. But you were asking us whether or not intellectually and philosophically the right thing to do would be to continue to cleave to that organisation or not. We're not talking about but, tantrums. We're saying here with, there are actually in, in agreements which we've signed. Uh, we have pledged to remain within the ECHR. The ECHR, uh, I mean, you know better than most how much I despise the surrender we made in Northern Ireland, but the ECHR is pretty much embodied in the agreements we have there. Uh, and people raise that, it, it, the it No one has to have a tantrum. All they need to do is say, you said you'd do this in return for this, you haven't done it, so we will now hamper... Uh, trade and other relations with uh, with you in response to what you've done. We are not the, the problem with this country. Uh, ever since the 1970s, is that it has given away so much of its sovereignty, and people don't realise how little room for manoeuvre a British government has in these matters. I, I would wish it were otherwise, but if, if, if you want, to, if people want to take those those routes, they have to understand that they have hard consequences, which they might, may find harder to deal with than they expect. I don't like it. I'm not advocating it. I'm just saying this is what we face. There are prices to bear for being a sovereign country. Proper defence and control of one's borders is part of being. A a sovereign country. If there are prices to bear, they are to be borne.